for joining. I think we're going to have people wandering in for um, quite some bit of time because sessions are a little bit staggered given um, the intense security this morning. So my name is Stacy Donahue. I'm a managing director at Luminate, which some of you may know previously as the governance and citizen engagement initiative of Omidyar Network. Uh, we have recently, as of last October, spun out into an independent entity uh, with a new name, so uh, great new name, uh, same mission. Uh, and <laughs> so um, with that, I would like to introduce to you our panel for today. We have three innovators in the Latin American civic tech landscape um, who all uh, are investees of Luminate, by the way. Um, yes. And the topic for today's panel is impact, not surprisingly. Um, and what we're going to do is um, a bit of a fishbowl format, but it's going to be modified fishbowl. Um, have people done this before? I, I actually had not, so this is new for me. But the concept is that the panelists are going to speak for 15 minutes about um, their experience in, in trying to create impact and challenges to impact. And then we're going to have 15 minutes where those of you in the audience can feel free to either talk about your own experiences or ask the panelists questions. And the reason it's called a fishbowl is because theoretically you would actually get up and go tap one of these panelists on the shoulder and sit in their seat um, and they would move out of the way. So it is a way to make things more um, interactive and lively. The issue, however, with our setup today is that um, it's not really conducive to a lot of getting up and moving around. It's like the dead fishbowl where everyone is um, in place. So, um, so we're gonna do modified fishbowl, which is that you just stay where you are um, but just raise your hand if you want to um, take the floor and speak for a few minutes uh, on um, your experiences. Uh, so we'll do that for 15 minutes and then we'll go back to the panelists for 15 more minutes and then back to you guys for 15 minutes. So that should keep us all um, uh, awake and energized. Um, and if anyone sort of speaks too long and starts to dominate the floor, um, I reserve the right as the moderator to, to give you the fishbowl hook to, uh, uh, no pun intended, to, um, to let others speak. Um, but hopefully that'll be a way that everyone feels comfortable speaking. I was a little concerned that that format might um, inhibit people who are a little more introverted who don't want to get up and actually go sit in someone's seat. So would love it if everyone will really feel comfortable speaking. So with that, um, I will turn it over first um, to Alessandra Orofino from NOSAS, who you heard um, in her amazing keynote speech yesterday, and then followed by Fabro Steibel from ITS in Rio, and followed by Lucia Abalanda Casale from Avina Foundation. So Alessandra, take it away. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I think most of you probably heard me yesterday, so I will let most of the time. Uh, to my colleagues here. I am the ED of NASAS, and for those of you who weren't here yesterday morning, um, NASAS is a laboratory for activism and civic engagement in Brazil, and we also do work in other Latin American countries, mostly tr through trainings and partnerships with existing organizations. We don't operate campaigns in other Latin American countries. We did, however, just anecdotally, um, give a training to a bunch of Colombian activists uh, just a few days ago and yesterday apparently the president of the Colombian Congress was tweeting out that he was being harassed by thousands of emails on his inbox um, about the campaign um, and, and complaining about it publicly but he did get the activists a meeting with him so there you go. Um, so, but. He, Essentially what we do is that we create different, what we call different civic engagement infrastructures, so different groups um, that are very locally focused in different cities in Brazil or have a very specific cause orientation. Um, and we start campaigning using these infrastructures um, for a long period of time, enough to build a community around them of trust and, 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 and sort of common identification. And then over time, we take people that have already campaigned on issues that we consider to be relatively easy or consensual into more difficult issues, either more technical um, or that sort of provoke more debate um, uh, throughout the city or for that cause. Um, usually our issues were multi-cause by nature, but usually we, um, we focus on either sort of human rights at large, 
uh, sustainability also at large or transparency, good governance um, and just effective government. Um, and, and interestingly, in the case of Brazil, usually human rights issues are more associated with the left. Uh, um, transparency, corruption, etc. those issues more associated with the right, um, unfortunately, but it's, it's the case in Brazil. And then the environmental issues are the ones that are less polarizing for now, so it's an interesting sort of way of thinking about it. We use a lot of technology for the work that we do. Um, all of our campaigns have sort of a technical backbone or a digital backbone, and we use digital essentially to organize more effectively, but we also always have at least one tactic or something that we're doing in the world that happens offline. Um, and that helps us sort of get closer to decision makers and really guarantee that impact. So the way we think about it is that we use digital to aggregate huge numbers of people, to make it easier for people to identify topics that are interesting to them, to identify other people in their communities that are, care about the same things um, in a very sort of low barrier to entry way. So even if you're I don't know, commuting back and forth every day and, and you have a family and you don't have a lot of time, you can still get engaged in your community by something um, easy to do and on your phone. Um, but um, we also have that sort of offline footprint as a way of sort of raising above the noise and also signaling to decision makers that um, whatever they're, they're perceiving is not just something that is sort of a social media phenomenon that will go away very quickly, but there's a real infrastructure around it uh, that is capable of keeping up pressure over time, um, and that usually elicits um, quicker sort of government response to whatever our communities are asking for. Uh, we've been doing that for a few years now, so we're, we have almost, almost a million and a half members registered in different um, parts of the organization in different areas in Brazil. Um, and we're able to also raise money from our members, not enough to cover all of our costs, uh, but enough to do a few interesting things that we wouldn't necessarily uh, be able to do otherwise. Um, and all of our technology, all of the sort of including chatbot technology, and we now developed our first WhatsApp chatbot through the, the API, API that WhatsApp is testing out. All of that is sort of embedded or talks to each other through a one common platform that is our internal platform that we're now starting to open up to third parties, partner organizations, friends of NOSAs. Um, so we're just t testing that out as well. And the fact that we use a common platform actually gives us a common database, so we're able to evaluate impact um, through this sort of common database. So that's just initial thoughts. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. My name is Fabra, Fabra Steiber. I come from ITS, Institute for Technology Society of Rio. I would say that the cause of ITS is to identify causes. So we're try always trying to understand what would be the next thing that we're not paying attention to. <laughs> so two years ago, one of the directors uh, came and said, we should talk about digital identity. And I said, uh, what? Um, and right now I can see how digital identity is kind of like an infrastructure to discuss everything. Last year, the referendum um, for gun control rights went for a discussion in the Congress because it was not a digital identity system. 4,000 people voted yes, and then in front of a participatory experience in the Congress, it went for a vote in the Congress. Luckily, it stopped there, but things could go really wrong with bots and so on. Um, uh, 1st of April, there will be a Berkeley article on how Android is leaking privacy and so on. If you read it, one of the things is about that they cannot identify who does what app and where. This is also a digital identity issue that we are trying to understand. And for bank inclusion, uh, participatory inclusion, all this is about digital rights. So digital rights, uh, digital identity made no sense to me until we start to understand that. Um, around 2007, uh, we are discussing internet rights and we come, again, uh, we come together with the Ministry of Justice of Brazil to create the first collaborative portal for the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights. By then there was no this idea of having a collaborative portal to co-create public policies. And today Tim Barnes-Lee says that the Brazilian Internet Bill of Rights is a right to internet, internet bill done with internet people and so on. So ITS is kind of trying to understand what to be the next cause that will, cause that will kind of create infrastructure uh, for a good civic debate. Particularly in terms of our area of democracy and technology, we have a chatbot, Alda. Alda works with public security in Rio. So if we can do something public security in Rio, 
You that is connect government and civil society i say mm -hmm. it works anywhere <laughs> um, it's work with uh, current existing mechanisms of public participation and helps people to follow and track uh, send suggestions for the next agenda meeting and so on and it's being adopted by by policies by, by uh, police and as well by civil servants we also have mudamus that uses blockchain to promote trust in the signature of digital identities so government was not trusting signatures collected by paper, people were not trusting government systems to sign petitions, and in 25 years only seven petitions passed Congress that collected enough signatures. So they said we can use blockchain, very little blockchain, just a necessary one, to create trust. And now three cities have adopted, we already passed three bills using the systems uh, in the legislative. And we also have the bot catcher, which is an algorithm to identify if a Twitter profile is a bot or not. And this is about media literacy. So we want to enforce uh, ownership in the audience that they can know if the bots, if the Twitter accounts around them are bots or not. So instead of explaining the propaganda, computational propaganda or the bot systems, we want to provide media literacy and ownership. So, um, like Gnosis, that is a huge inspiration for us. Uh, sometimes we use their tools, they are very good. Uh, we exchange lots of thoughts on that. We try to understand what's coming next. And then, last sentence that I would say, I'm an optimist. I think we, ha we are in a very, very uh, innovative moment to create new networks of civic participation. I come from Brazil, Bolsonaro, my president, golden shower, I know what it is. <laughs> It doesn't seem like this, but we see lots of emerging movements coming from civil society, from private sector, from political parties to occupy politics. And I think our job is to how to support these new movements coming so they can have intra-movement participation, they can be, have a intra-transparency, intra-accountability that I think if you don't have in the base, you cannot claim later on in the byproduct YouTube. I hope everyone followed the golden shower controversy Inclu involving the Brazilian president, otherwise that would have been a very strange comment. <laughs> Google it offline. Google it, yeah, yeah. yeah. you'll you get a kick out of it. It's official it tweet from the president. It was an Why did you go to the shower? Yeah, anyway. That's the times we're living in. Perfect. Hello everyone, my name is Lucia. I work in Fundación Avina, in, and in Fundación Avina I manage Altec, that is Alliance um, focus on civic technology, an alliance that is from uh, Luminate and, and, and Avina. Um, the alliance, very connected with Fabio, uh, <laughs> have the aim to create networks. Uh, we focus in collaborative process in order to pull, have also to bridge the gap between civic technology developers on the civil society organizations that have been working for many, many, many years in Latin America, and also with journalists, and also with people from government. So we try to not to, to, to support like projects related to civic debt, but really try to focus on problems and opportunities, and try to involve different people related to this problem, and, and trying to build an idea and after that uh, develop a process that sometimes have to use technology, but sometimes not. Sometimes they use campaigns based in some way with technology, but not a specific to develop an app. Uh, this process has allowed us to, for example, create different networks in Latin America related to journalism. For example, a very specific network related to water and journalism that works in Argentina, Uruguay, Peru, and Mexico, because the privatization of water is a big, big, big issue in Latin America. Also, for example, uh, we create a network related to the monitoring of elections that works in Colombia, Mexico, Argentina, and Uruguay. They, they, they work together and develop teams that uh, follow up and oversight all the election process in the different countries and after that exchange practice about how we can improve the oversight and the participation in elections. Um, also, for example, we create a specific project that 
uh, that related to participatory budget in different in different uh, countries like Argentina, for example. So we we try to develop with our allies different practice of participation that try to be more inclusive and try to in, be more connected with the civil society organizations that work in this um, in this specific area. Um, I, one of the main issues that in general uh, civic tech have is that it's difficult to engage and a real amount of, of person for a long time. Sometimes they have a, like a very specific moment that is the high moment of the of the of the media of the or a specific context. But we try to look who are the owners of the process and try to maintain this process for a long, long, long time. For for example, the manage the, the the particip participatory budget process in Argentina he, uh, keep uh, rising uh, for about five years. Look, what is a lot for civic tech. Yes. Um, also, we work uh, a lot with new technologies trying to explore, but in, really, in, in a really good connection with civil society. For example, the use of blockchain but blockchain was not only to develop the technology and try to taste the case, but also work with the government and civil society and how to use it and how to change the internal structure of government. For example, in Argentina, we create a project related to blockchain uh, and subsidies uh, that the government gives to artists and single mothers. And also in in Chile, uh, we use blockchain um, to review the quality of the data related to energy, and and so on. We have like many projects, but the focus is to to be able to connect different type of vision to to to, to co-create a project uh, to to focus on in not to be the technology the end, but the, the way to create a, a more inclusive process. Also, we have a great focus in political education that we, cre we think this uh, nowadays is a key issue related to civic tech projects. It's impossible to think in, in to have uh, a better participation with the use of technology without thinking in political um, Formation particip uh, I don't know how to say it, but for the formation politica. Uh, so, so okay, that's more or less what we do. So, Lucy, I, I heard you talk about two potential barriers mm -hmm. to impact. One is the difficulty in maintaining engagement of people mm -hmm. over time, uh, and the other was um, the need to change internal structures of government and how hard that is. Yeah. Um, Favro and Alessandra, can you give us in just a few quick bullet points of what you find as some of the main challenges and barriers to impact that you face? Okay. So I think one challenge is that <coughs> policy framing. So if you frame something on the left or the right, you might stay in the bubble. So the problem is how to reach the shadow people. So the shadow people, I say, is the people that are not in the light of a really extreme either left and right. So how do you design something for these people? And I believe it's not about macro trend, I believe it's about micro trend. It's about small changes, small opportunities for participation. And if you can create good opportunities for democratic participation within the people, although they might disagree on gun control, abortion, so on, they might agree on participatory mm -hmm. budgeting for a school, yeah. uh, for example. So for me, the, the challenge is that we focus too much on the agendas on the left and right, and I'm not saying they're not important, but there's a lot of shadow in the middle, and I think the opportunity is there. I completely agree with what's already been said. What I would add is that, uh, and, and the two main challenges for us are also, I think, in a different way, but are also maintaining engagement over time and broadening that engagement over time, and then, of course, soliciting response in government, and that requires most of the time changing government infrastructure uh, to some degree. 
What we have learned, though, is that that's particularly hard if you're trying to do it in the abstract. It gets a lot easier if you have a very specific policy demand and you sort of use that also as a vehicle for changing practices. So if you want to convene government and say, why don't you create an effective way for people to influence what you do? Um, in the abstract, they may, they may even do something, but most, more often than not, the response will be something very superficial that allows people to participate but doesn't necessarily obligate government to listen. Um, so it lets the peop we'll let the people speak, but we don't necessarily want to listen to what they're saying. Um, however, if you have a very specific sort of um, demand that has social um, clout and people really want it to move through, then that becomes a vehicle for how government will respond. Um, we've seen that a few times, and I think it's our best bet for that. I think we also have to take um, take some learn a few lessons from aggressive sort of commercial strategies that different companies have been using. When I look at what, and I'm not by any means saying that they're mm -hmm. always ethical. However, um, they they do tend to work, and I think there is a way for us to get inspiration from them in an ethical way. If you look at the way Uber, for instance, has sort of created new markets, right? Usually, what they do is that they first get adopted. And then they say, regulate me in a way that allows me to operate because I'm already adopted. So I'm already something that the population wants to some extent, and there's already public demand for what I do. Now, give me permission to operate. If they did it the other way around, if they said, please give me permission to operate, and then I will start running my service, they would never run their services anywhere, really. Um, I think to some extent, as sort of promoters of civic tech, we have to think about that as well. How do we create ways of engaging with government that people really use and people really want? And then we say, hey, now you can't just close that door. You're going to have to turn this into something that is official and, and that can have sort of uh, stability over time. Um, I would say that's hacking the system, but I hate that expression. What I really think it is, it's sort of hijacking it. Um, and I think we need to do it more often than not. Um, but yeah. OK. So this is the first time we're going to do the fishbowl format of having other people um, add their perspectives as well. If people have either questions about what the panelists have said so far or want to add their own experiences about uh, where they've seen impact in their own organizations or where they've faced barriers to impact. Please. So I, I found it interesting that um, uh, you mentioned the was a minister who was saying he was being harassed by his email. Yes. Right? And and on kind of our side of civic tech, we're all about the input of civic engagement, mm -hmm. right? And building up that capacity for civic engagement. And yet, it seems like, in my experience working in this field for 13, 14 years, is that we, we fail to make sure that um, those on the receiving end can ingest that that feedback in meaningful ways mm -hmm. that don't just overwhelm their staff and systems in ways that they they don't feel prepared for. So a lot of the time when I, I talk to citizens about civic engagement and strategies, I'm trying to talk to them about strategies that are going to create the, the lowest barrier mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. entry into power. Um, so as you're building these tools and resources that help create this, this massive pipeline for engagement, what thoughts do you have or what tools are you seeing or challenges that you're seeing on the side where government is trying to absorb that information and make meaningful use of it? Because it's one thing to get tens of thousands of emails that sort of feel like you have to respond. It's a very different thing on those micro issues to be able to see those as a lawmaker and to be able to respond to those micro communities that are I can, I can react to that. So um, let me see where I can start. I think fr from, from my experience, uh, I haven't been working with this for 14 years, but I have been working on it for, I don't know, 10 years now. Um, what I've seen is oftentimes when governments uh, create platforms for civic engagement, they do it in a way that is similar to trying to d predefine the path of a public protest, for instance. So if you say, you can protest, absolutely, your right to protest is being preserved, but you can only protest on this square on Sundays from 4 to 5. You're sort of looking at the least disruptive way of giving people their right to engage, right? And really, activism, if it's not disruptive, it doesn't work. 
it needs to be disruptive to some extent for people to pay attention. I'm not advocating for violence by any means, but I am advocating for some level of disruption. If everything is allowed to function in the same way that it was, then there's very little chance of it getting anywhere. However, and there's a flip, a flip side to it, disruption only gets you so far, right? It gets you attention, it may get you a meeting or a decision that it favors whatever cause people are rallying around. It won't necessarily sustain depth over time. And, and, and it won't necessarily be the ideal um, sort of context for complex conversations to take place. And complex conversations are always important to achieve change. So the way we've been sort of trying to think about it is, how do we create disruption initially, but then also once we sort of gain that attention, uh, channel information in a way that is digestible so it can start a new conversation. I'll give you a practical example from um, a campaign that I mentioned yesterday, so most people already have the context. When we did a campaign on the public school that was going to be demolished, we created a lot of disruption. We flooded everyone's, essentially, every, every decision maker on that scene. We flooded their inbox. We didn't flood their WhatsApp um, numbers because they weren't really using WhatsApp at that level at the, at the time, but today we would flood their WhatsApp as well. We, we did petitions, we did press, we did the webcam, we did all kinds of things that were meant to be disruptive and meant to be a little bit overwhelming. But then government said, here's how we're gonna respond. We're gonna have a public hearing um, to know what the school community would like to do about this and also hear from the business owners in the, in the region that might benefit from the parking lot. Uh, so we want to reach sort of a consensus here through this public hearing. And the public hearing that they proposed was going to happen, I remember very precisely because it was a big debate, it was going to happen on a Wednesday at 1 p.m. So no one from the school community really could go, they couldn't attend, uh, the business owners couldn't really attend either. So it was a way for them to sort of say that they were responding to it but not really and of course what we did is that we kept the disruption up we said that's not good enough like if you if you if your way of creating debate is by calling a physical public hearing at a time and day that no one can be there then it's not good enough we kept the disruption up and then they had to come back to us and say okay how do we then engage in a constructive conversation um now that you've sort of overwhelmed us uh, without being a public hearing at 1 p.m on a wednesday and then we ended up settling for a public hearing on a Saturday, a day where people could go. We did a crowdfunding campaign and we hired physical buses to pick up all of the students, the kids and their parents from the school, bring them to the public hearing on that Saturday. So we also used sort of the power of the crowd to sort of make sure they could attend. And we had a digital platform where people could sort of interact with what was going on as the public hearing was happening. I don't think that was a perfect solution, but I think it was definitely easier from the government side to digest and it gave them better quality information than just the sort of over flooding of messages had. But I don't think we would have achieved that without some level of disruption either. So I think both probably need to go hand in hand if we want government to respond. That's at least from my, my perspective, but I am working outside of government. Of course, if you're already working inside of a government structure, I think it's different. But the way I would encourage anyone working inside of government to think about activism is that oftentimes when activists create disruption, they, always, they also give you the political space to negotiate for a better solutions. So you can say, this is not just me as a disruptor <coughs> internally trying to get you big government structure to be more transparent and open. This is me trying to help you really respond to something that is a public um, acclaim. It's something that the people want. So activists also sort of give you that excuse to say, that to, to create that political space for better negotiations to happen internally in the favor of more transparency and accountability. Do other people have perspectives on that method of starting with activism and then going towards negotiation? Have you used that in your work or do you have a different method or perspective? Anyone? Please. Yeah, maybe I'm um, thinking of a few uh, campaigns we did in Burundi or the bloggers uh, network that we support in Burundi. Can you speak up, please? Yes. Yeah, um, you yeah. could use your. Oh, be careful of audio. Sorry, injury. I won't shout. So, we support blogger networks uh, in restricted settings, uh, and among one is uh, Burundi. And uh, I think we are a media organization, so uh, we have, uh, um, I think, pretty large digital platforms 
running there. And I think by 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 scaling, so by by having uh, a crowd of young people uh, online already, and um, uh, uh, yeah, making sure that a certain issue is is read or is being seen by by a lot of people is actually already a good step to to influence government. For example, they had there was an issue there with. Um, uh, registering your comp your company as a as a starting uh, entrepreneur, and it costed like a, yeah like like it was an amount that nobody actually could pay, and then they started you know campaigning about that, but also having offline debates. But uh, I think at, at some point things were being retreated, and then they kind of um, uh, asked for the the chamber of commerce to, to respond. And at some point they said, okay, we have to lower that. So um, it's yeah, it's maybe we're working together with media or with uh, yeah, platforms where the media, where young people are, uh, are, uh, are at. How many of the people in the room are um, working in organizations that you would describe as activists? Ver so ha raise of hands for that. Hello. <laughs> um, and how many people in the room would describe their organizations as um, more collaborative with government to deploy civic tech or other technologies? And it, um, is there another category that I'm missing here? Anyone just shout out if, if I haven't described you or put you in a box that makes you comfortable, tell me. Can I ask? I, I mean, is there a clear, mutually exclusive element to this? I, so we work with government in, in what I do, but we there's like a lot of small nudging we've had to do. Uh, sometimes uh, with uh, technology, sometimes we make it like there's nothing we can do. Now you have to do this, but there's there's a lot of stuff we've done working with government where I think that you know we're not coming with protest placards, but where we feel like there's kind of an activist or an implicit activism in how we try to reshape how they kind of have to respond or have to view uh, how they engage with citizens. And so I, I don't know, I, I just wonder, do people usually do it in kind of very separate buckets? Because I always kind of feel like a secret activist, if that makes sense, or sometimes more explicit. But, but um, we have to be careful about it because we have of how we work with government. But I, I, mm -hmm. I don't know, do people feel like that's something they have to kind of wear a separate hat for? Yeah, I think that's a lovely, you've drawn out a lovely thing that exists throughout the civic tech field that doesn't really have a good name, which is there's definitely, there's vendors to government that would literally do anything for money, and then there's vendors to government that come with quite a lot of values, and that are sort of like secret mm -hmm. campaigners. Um, I used to run my site, it was very clearly in the like secret campaigner sort of like category. I very often wish I would do anything for money. Don't <laughs> 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 so, we all. Um, <laughs> But the fact that doesn't have a name, that's really important, right? Because there's a really important mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I raise a question? Maybe it's a bit unpopular, but I'm hearing a lot about the you know, civil tech ecosystem, and basically each actor has been um, you know, touched upon in the past few days, like tech players, companies, governments, activists, citizens, tech, um, a civic tech. But definitely the traditional animal, like civil society organization, is like there has been no mention of it. So I just wonder, like, what is, particularly in your case, like, how are you working with, like, um, more traditional NGOs? Like, how, what is the relationship? Do you have, like, specific tactics in terms of your role, their role, um, maybe one specific campaign or advocacy to offer training? Um, like, what, what, what are you, what do you feel, um, what is your role vis-a-vis -vis that sector? And, you know, how, how do you feel about that? His uh, <laughs> For us, we started to work with civic tech because we spent like, I don't know, 12 years working in Latin America with traditional civic CSOs. They have the, the knowledge about the topics. They are the specialists and know what is the problem, what are the opportunities, uh, how to use technology. Because, because at the end, te technology is only part of the solution. So. Get involved the CS the CSOs is for me at least from Avina from a tech perspective and experience is the first things that we do. 
uh, for us it's impossible to think in to think in a, in developing a project or to implement a technology or a campaign without experience uh, of a traditional CSO. For example, in Colombia, also Colombia, Colombia is like the, the yes. star in this moment, <laughs> yes. uh, in related to the peace process, uh, we work with a very young uh, technology organization that's called Mobilizatorio, but also with a very traditional organization that called Misangre, uh, that is a organization that it know everything about the peace process uh, in Colombia, that this is part of the, the group of the organizations that accompany all the process of the peace process in Colombia, and they come together and try to mobilize in order to set the, the preference and the perspective of young people in Colombia about the peace process. But perhaps if Mobilizatorio uh, try to do this alone, they, they don't have all this experience and the knowledge that uh, Misangre uh, have related to all the process and the history of the peace process in Colombia. For me, it's like it's something that they, the, the both perspective create something that none of the organization could reach alone, so it's amazing. Uh, I was smiling because we always like to think about the intrapreneur. The intrapreneur is the person that doesn't leave the organization to make a change. And when the civic tech culture is not within the running of an organization, it's very hard to introduce civic tech. But there is always an intrapreneur inside who wants to do it. So when you think about more traditional civil society, we, what we usually do is that we hear first from the entrepreneur that wants civic tech, we go to him, we prepare something, and then take some time until there's a window of opportunity to implement it. But Transparency International, MS International, several of these big ones, they are struggling to use the civic tools. And maybe what we try to show is the civic tool is not an end, it's a mean. So if they can understand how their tier of change goes well with civic tech, and how they need to change themselves to use it becomes easier for them to adopt this as a way to do it. But it's a very long process. If they are young, if they're like us, that we just, yeah, let's do it, easy. But usually we are not the average. I think it's a, a completely long, long, long process. For that reason, when we think like a, a partner for a technology process is not to give up like a product, yeah, after that, okay, leave the organization alone. When we are thinking to a partnership between a traditional CSO and a civic tech organization, we are thinking about two years process, uh, that a process that takes at least two years. Yes, and change a lot of things inside the organization, but there are changes that, for me, we, we call it resilient uh, changes because there are changes that in some way are difficult to yes, come back to the starting point. Good expression. Yeah. And I would observe from where I sit and working with organizations in multiple different countries that the context varies a lot or the, the interaction between civil society and tech organizations varies a lot by geography. Uh, and Latin America, I would say, is one of the geographies mm -hmm. in which I do see a lot of interaction between the two. Uh, by contrast, in the U.S., I, f I find them to be very separate um, mm -hmm. domains that now are starting to come together a little bit more, but historically have, have not really. Um, whereas in Africa, there's definitely more convergence um, between the different sectors, and, and in some of our emerging work in Asia, um, not so much. So I think a lot to learn there, but it's an excellent point about kind of who we convene in a room and, and the fact that there aren't as many um, traditional civil society players at a, at a convening like this. I think it's, it's a great point. So lots of hands now. How about I'll go to Mika and then to you. Again. So I, I was going to ask if you might reflect on or, or give us some insight into how much you worry about anti-civic technology. Um, oh, yes. And the reason I ask is because is, is, 
uh, maybe in the United States we have a slightly more advanced experience of what happens when uh, tech becomes ubiquitous, a certain type of tech, right? Hypercapitalist, extractive tech. Um, and, and so our advocacy sector, for example, is suffers the tragedy of the commons. Everybody is trying to run campaigns and they aren't unique anymore. There, there's so many of them, every viral video beats everybody else's viral video mm -hmm. and we have a race to the bottom of brainstem, which is to say, find the most spectacular emotional message because that's what Facebook will amplify for you. Um, so I'm wondering if, if this is a context for people in Latin America as well, and whether you're doing anything in your own work or seeing any possibility of pushing back. Because mm -hmm. it seems to me that real civic space is almost non-existent. It's mostly colonized by tech companies. Um, and most of these campaigns and, and practices exist on private servers. Um, and so I'm curious, is this, you know, play along with it because we don't have a choice or is there some room for pushing back? Great question. Um, we've been thinking a lot about this a lot, actually since we started. Um, so I have, I think, scattered thoughts, not really a coherent answer, but a few thoughts are, first of all, I think as, as in my case, as activists, as people operating um, in that space, we've definitely seen that race to the bottom, um, and there's a lot of noise out there. Um, in the case of developing countries like Brazil, I think and to some extent it's even worse because we're exposed not just to our own noise, but also to the American noise, everyone, everyone else's, because the level of influence uh, on that way, it's just a lot greater than it is on the other way around. Um, I, I, one thing that we've been careful to do, and I don't think that it's enough by any means, but I think it is one step, is ensuring that we do not confuse audience with membership um, and community. Um, I think a lot of, especially when you talk about uh, more traditional civil society organizations, when, when they finally say we need to be more tech-driven or more digital-driven, really what they mean is we need to build an audience on social media uh, and they hire someone to do it, uh, which they should, they should have some audience on social media. It is good for reputational issues. It is good now for interacting with certain um, elected officials even, which are living on Twitter and like doing governing on Twitter really. So it has become a political space and we should be there. But, um, but that audience is highly contingent on the, po the commercial policies of providers um, and it can be taken away from you very quickly. So building community is, is fundamentally different from that. Um, and it is a lot more resource intensive and it requires boots on the ground and real meetings and real sort of face time. Um, and I think it goes back to the question that we were raising in the beginning of the session of how we measure impact. I think the funder community is not prepared necessarily for, um, for resourcing uh, at, at the intensity that building community requires and for, for following impact measurement in a way that is that honors uh, the different numbers that you get when you're really trying to measure a community, not just audience. So become, as a sector, I think, too accustomed to the very high numbers. I have a petition and it has five gazillion million signatures and we sort of value that implicitly or explicitly. Uh, when I think maybe 10 years ago that was a really great way of, of achieving real world impact, I don't think it's the case anymore because of that noise. Uh, whereas a community that is able to re-engage often, that has other ways of connecting and is also ready to stand in solidarity with each other, actually give work, time and value to each other, I think that's uh, that will n necessarily give you numbers that are less impressive but it will give you the ability to raise abo above the noise and, and not be so dependent on the tech companies. When it comes to the servers that we use, the security apparatus that we have, um, yes, all of that, it, it touches upon commercial interests too. I think it's less, to, from my perspective, it's less worrisome than turning social media into our main, into our main civic space because 
the companies that operate their services tend to be a bit uh, just commercially different from social media companies, but it's still worrisome. And we have few uh, technology companies that are mission driven that resemble what you were just describing, but from a, a civil society perspective, right? Like they're not just trying to do anything for money, they're also, uh, but they do exist. They exist in this room and as vendors to government. I think they don't exist as much as vendors to civil society. One of the things that we're trying to do is uh, make our technology available to our partners, not just because it could bring us some revenue, we could, but also because we've noticed that in the global south, the technology that is available to campaigners is usually provided by some company in the US, MailChimp, the like, um, that has, that really built a product for marketers, and usually they're great products, that's why we use them. It's hard to copy them because that requires real investment. So we won't be able to replace them completely, not with the resources that we have, but a few of the functionality can be done with relatively like sort of low, low levels of investment in technology, and we can price that using our own currency. We're not going to be necessarily uh, subject to currency fluctuation. Like currency fluctuation in and of itself is one of my biggest issues as a, use a heavy user of digital technologies that are developed in the global north because they're all priced in dollars and the real my currency has lost 50 percent of its value in the past two years which means that that big chunk of my budget has fluctuated like crazy now i'm big enough to sort of absorb it but if you're talking about a small grassroots group in latin america they won't they won't use the technology anymore because just, they literally cannot pay for it and i'm not even getting into the ethical and other implications of of being so reliant on big tech uh, but we don't have a perfect answer for that yet. I think we definitely need to work on it. What we did, um, well, two agendas. The one is how to make uh, social media more uh, community-driven, uh, like button, share button, so on. This is one discussion. But what we launched six months ago was the ITS TV. So ITS TV is not a TV. It's like MTV in the 90s. <laughs> Any program we do, the algorithm is the format. So if Facebook prioritizes lives, then our format is live. If podcasts, then podcasts, is WhatsApp and so on. So we're trying to use all the networks as possible to create content, to reach out audiences where they are, and then put in the projects we have within this reach. Does it work? Is a try and error. But we see membership coming. We mm -hmm. see people engaging. And then we use it strategically. So what I'm trying to say is that we know we'll never win the game, of uh, not using private um, tools for that. What we're saying is that to diversifying the tools we have so we can have, uh, it works for us. But it's very costly. We see a lot in Latin America that the, we develop the same technology once and again, again and again and again. <laughs> so also we try to create a, a big and a strong community using the uh, offline space, uh, spaces. For example, there is a huge event in Latin America that called Abre Latam y con Datos, that more or less showing all the community related to civic tech, uh, open data, uh, and government, and journalists uh, that are interested in, in that file, in this field, sorry. Um, so we support this, this space. This space has seven years, that is a lot for an event. And we use this annual space in order to share technology. And for example, in many countries, you start to see that the organization start to share the same uh, tool. And also they start to develop in, in, in as, a, as, a, as, a, as a team, for example. Um, Uruguay and Paraguay, they are working together in a tool in order to, I don't know, support the, um, the offenses to human rights, uh, the, the offenses for human rights in activism. So they start to in, find ways in order to develop uh, and to adopt technology, but in a showing, showing way in order to be cheaper and also easier to use. The gentleman in blue, did you still want to? Sure. Um, so, kind of, Alessandra uh, and Conor, uh, you talked a little bit about kind of finding that space between like the highly polemical types of issues and the kind of really practical that people can dig in on. 
and how that changes the, the kind of framing and how you're received in, in the type of activism you're doing. And I think Pada touched a little bit with what you were saying about difference in geographies. And I was wondering, so I work a lot in Germany, France, the Netherlands, uh, Belgium, where there is kind of this space and you're, you're allowed to kind of go in on these issues, but I see places around the world where, and I wondered about the Latin American context, where kind of what should be a very reasonable <laughs> request or idea is taken as, like, it, it, right. there is no, there is too much heat, just kind of generally, that kind of very reasonable ideas or very reasonable suggestions are, you are suddenly kind of painted with a label and you're suddenly, kind of, there isn't that space. I, I think kind of the US sometimes is that way where, you know, sometimes reasonable ideas, so when, uh, Miguel and I talked, so also from Europe, uh, we got the point that, okay, here's a region uh, in a country where all of the men voted on whether or not to let women vote, and they all decided and agreed they should. And so like, how do you, how do you engage with that? And you see that in Latin America where there are regions or, or issues where there just is no space where you immediately kind of get painted as a political actor and kind of shove it aside in some way. And how do you, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll hi hijack one of your sentences yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, they asked you, why don't you join politics? And I said, yeah. first, I am in politics, mm -hmm. and second, running elections might be not the right time. Mm. So I think it's very important to create bridges instead of breaking. So when you have like uh, opinions about something, they will say you're left and right, and this will be the first tag you have. But keep going and focus on the topic. There's a very good report I love and I learned lots of from Instituto Update, Update Institute in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And it's from Civic Tech from the peripheries. So he goes to places I don't know and I can go. And he got uh, innovations on landing rights, heritage rights, constitutional rights. Lots of things that me as a Civic Tech, uh, I know everything is going, I was not aware of. So there's lots of this activism uh, trying to occupy institution happening. And they are not left and right. They might be evangelical. They might be from the militaries. They might be from the favelas. We don't know. So what I will try to say is that we need to get institution, how institutions work, uh, hack their system, their rules, and create tools that join there. So there is always an opportunity to, to join. I'll finish with a promise I made my mom and I never fulfilled. Um, <laughs> My mom asked, hi son, what can I do to change the world or how can I join politics? And I can't give a good answer to her until today. Because about mechanism of civic participation, it's about impact and so on. There are so few windows of participation. So the reality is that usually you have to create pain points to enter or you have to create a slowly cultural change, so few windows of participation. But there exists, and our job, I think, is to hack the systems and to create the change there with tech. From our perspective, um, in the sort of bridging the gap issue, well, first of all, we're not going to shy away from an issue just because it's become heated. I, th I think you're absolutely right. In many places in the world, it's not just that they have become more far right. It's that the center of the political debate has shifted. Yes. Right. So things that were once considered this is the things that we can all agree on. These are sort of the basic rules of civilized, civilized sort of societies have then become, oh, that's actually the far left. So things like human rights or freedom of expression, like all of that has become very politicized. We're not going to shy away from that just because of that. But what we've learned is that the, who, who the people hear something from oftentimes matter more, matters more to their perception of it being to political or to radical than the contents of the message. So if they hear something from us, but they don't have a relationship to us already established over years, um, and they perceive it to be radical, they won't necessarily engage with it. But they, if they hear the same message from their mom or sister or whomever, someone that they trust, they have affection for, that reception may be entirely different. So when we tackle issues that we know are gonna be very heated, we tend to hyper-segment, only talk to people that we know are gonna agree with it. So we go the opposite side of trying to burst the bubble. We don't pretend that we can, unless it's people that have a very long history of engagement with us, and then we'll also include them in that segment. So we either talk to people that we know are gonna agree with the issue, 
because we know their engagement history, or they may disagree or they may see it initially as something that may be too radical for them, but they have such a long history with us that they will listen. And we only talk to them, but then we give them that information in a, in a way that is easy for them to share and pass along. So we trust that they will be our main vectors into their own uh, communities, families, uh, friends. So we trust them to burst the bubble, essentially. Um, because trying to do that ourselves just hasn't worked. Um, because we're not, the main, we're not necessarily the best interlocutors. So if we're talking about something like uh, women's rights, uh, we e we're either going to talk to the community that we know already is on board, or we're going to talk to um, people that have done many things with us before. However, when we do, our main request of that community will not be just take action. It will be convince your family to take action. And here are a few arguments that you can use. And these arguments are often, going back to your question about traditional civil society organizations. These arguments are often the arguments that civil society organizations will not use because they perceive them as being somehow counter, um, not counterintuitive, but somehow opposed to a tenant, like a principal tenant of the work that they do. In the case of abortion, for instance, oftentimes the argument that we have tested this, but the argument that works best with that sort of second audience, the audience of our, of our members, is saying that if you legalize abortion, abortion rates will drop. And traditional abortion rights organizations or women's rights organizations will never use that argument because most of what they've been saying is that abortion is not necessarily a bad thing anyways. Like the whole no one wants abortion, they don't want to go there because it could be a, it could be a good option for, for some women in some situations. So they don't, they don't want to make that argument. But it really works. And there is data to, to back it up. I mean, in Portugal, it has been the case. In Uruguay, it has been the case. When you legalize it, women get it through the, well, anyway, it's a big story, but it, it drops, right? So that's the kind of argument that we'll sort of create content on and we'll serve it, not directly to the public, but to our community and the community that we know already agrees with the whole legalized abortion stance and let them use that argument with their families and friends. Um, so when we're writing content, we're, we're writing it for that second tier um, and we talk about the second tier a lot, but we try to get the right vehicles to get there. And, and I think you, it's also an exercise in humility, knowing that you're not always the best, you're not always the best messenger. Um, and yeah, so if you don't want to be killed as the messenger, you, you might as well find a, a good one. I know that's kind of tactical, but I hope it helps. <laughs> You've all been combining technology and the civil society for years, and you've done loads of things. Can you tell us about some things that didn't work yes. that were useful? Yeah. <laughs> in the technology space specifically? Yeah. Well, any any attempt in the broadest possible way, way at West, you, some tech and some civil society has met, and what happened wasn't happening. Lots. What didn't, wasn't impacting. Sure. I mean, um, tech and civil society have met, and it wasn't help, uh, helpful. From our own work, for many years, we ran a sort of open platform where people could create their own campaigns, similar to other open platforms that then flooded the market after we had already sort of worked on that in Brazil. They existed elsewhere. Um, it worked for a while, then it stopped working because, again, too much noise, not enough community being built around it. Um, it became a vehicle for creating many audiences, but not necessarily for building the membership that you need to sustain it. So we killed it. So that worked <coughs> and then didn't work. And then from a more sort of things that I've seen, not necessarily that I've done. Um, I think in general, the whole, I don't know if that exists in other countries, I'm sure it does. Like the whole like petition the Senate, petition, like there is a open consultation process for the Senate in Brazil. It's essentially a poll and people take it and it's on bills. And it's a, it's a huge, I hate it, it's a huge disaster. Usually the way it works is that if it's really sensational, people will take part in it and then it will be somehow weaponized by senators that want to pass outrageous things. But if it's something that is really important and, and it, it gets more, it also gets sometimes the same level of engagement, but it's not interesting to the senators themselves, then they don't use it. So because there's no binding process, it doesn't go anywhere. So I think in general, like any technology that is sort of put on top of government, but it doesn't actually ch change the institutional pathways and doesn't create any binding processes around it, tends to be sort of participation washing. And, and worse yet, it can be weaponized. So when, when something emerges out of it that somehow a political group wants to capture, they will. But if it's not interesting to them, they won't. So I've seen that a few times too. You see that you have 
Yes. A lot of experience. So yes. Yeah. Things that didn't work. The first one, I think, arranged marriage. Uh, when, yes. When you, for example, have an excellent problem, you are convinced that you're going to change the world, trying to, I don't know, uh, uh, go to, the, I don't know, develop a project related to elections or some issue, and you decide which are the organizations that are the key organizations to involve in this process without thinking in the process like in a more broader way. That in general, that type of project are a disaster because sometimes the organizations don't want to work together or there are some parts that is missing. So we have like a lot of experience with projects that started as a good idea, but with partnership that in less than a year, they broke down and okay, the project is isolate, isolated without our owner. The other thing, and related to that, uh, is to, to don't have like an owner of the project. Besides that sometimes there are many actors involved in a project, even when the project is related directly to government, there is someone that is going to use this data in order to advocate for the process. For example, if we have like a, a platform of no sé, mo part participatory monitoring, okay, the, the platform will be connected with a local government but also we need our owners, I don't know, the ombudsman or the, I don't know, community of, of some, uh, the, the community agency or, or someone that is going to use this data in order to advocate and create changes. If we don't have this like person or figure, it's so difficult that the, that the project continues because at the end it's a, uh, it's, it's an empty space because you have data, you have the government's approval, but at the end you don't have users. So it's like an, a nightmare. And we, we have like an excellent project that are like the best best cases at, at a world level. That is that are mentioned in different books. Uh, for example, a case in Uruguay that is the, the, the platform is connected with uh, the local government. It was one of the first platform that was really connected with a local government and the platform changed the whole structure that the, the local government uh, reacts to monetary reporting was also an, an, an adaptation of Fix My Street. I'm saying too much, but uh, yeah. it's also in Montevideo. But the thing was that the wa there wasn't like an owner of this process, so the, the, the platform besides that was really important for the relation between government and, and civil society, the platform is empty. So at the end, the platform died more or less. Um, yes, uh, yeah, more or less, that is the, the two, two like big things that we learned related to that. Unfortunately, we are just about out of time um, for this session. I wanted to just sum up with um, repeating a few of the points here that really stuck with me um, and a lot to think about. The first one is uh, activism needs to be disruptive to work. Uh, I think that that is going to stick with me. Um, but the corollary point about our activism and collaboration mutually exclusive or um, is there some area in the middle or can an organization be activist at sometimes and collaborative at other times? Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting room for exploration there. Um, another point for me was don't confuse audience with community. Um, that is something that Speaking as a funder, funders have done for a very long time, um, and we've learned a lot of painful lessons from that. So I think that's something we should all be taking to heart. Um, Faber's point about diversifying the tools um, that you work with, because you won't be able to avoid them, um, but, but at least if you're not completely beholden to, to one, that gives you a little bit more leverage. Uh, also, creating bridges. Uh, the fact that you will be painted left or right in the world we, we live in today, but just keep going to build the bridges. I thought was very good advice. Um, also, who you hear from matters more than the content of the message. And that sometimes um, 
if you can't build bridges, <laughs> you shouldn't uh, try to burst bubbles, but uh, can, can get your message to people who can then do the work of trying to bridge rather than you trying to bridge it uh, with your own organization uh, is something that I think is really worth thinking about. Uh, and gave, gave me a lot of pause. And then um, finally, to sum up uh, Lucia's excellent point about no arranged marriages. Yes. I think um, we've seen a lot of those challenges in, in the work that we funded as well, um, all with the best intent of bringing together constituents um, towards a common goal. But um, uh, it, it needs to have an organic component. It, it can't be forced uh, or it won't work. So, so those were some takeaways for me. I hope that all of you have found this useful and please feel free to engage with the panelists afterwards or over the course of this event um, because we have our next uh, speaker starting in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.